Good afternoon and welcome to the latest of BioExcel's webinar series. Um, today uh, our main presenter is Guido van Zundert and he's going to be uh, presenting on robust solutions for cryo EM fitting and visualization of interaction space. Uh, after Guido has finished, um, we're going to get a, a little bit of a, a demo of some of the things that he's been talking about with sort of um, my, my colleague from BioExcel, Mikhail Trelle, and from Jörg Scharschmidt. And my name's Adam Carter. I'm uh, one of the people involved in the, the BioExcel project. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about the project just for no more than three minutes, really, uh, and then we'll get on to the main presentation today. So before we go any further, I should let you know that this webinar is being recorded, including the question and answer session at the end. Um, so we will then be posting it uh, on YouTube um, so that you can uh, revisit it again later on, but you should be aware that we've been recorded. Okay, so just a very brief introduction to BioExcel, because um, we're I expect that many of you are now familiar with the, the project as we've been going up for a while now. So um, BioExcel is a new center of excellence for computational biomolecular research. Um, it's sort of built on what we describe as three pillars. The first one is excellence in biomolecular software. So we're actually developing and improving some important pieces of software as part of the project. We have some of the, the lead developers from these programs from Grimax and Haddock, for example, in the BioExcel project. Um, and we're uh, working to improve the performance and efficiency and scalability of these, these codes. But as well as the codes themselves, another important aspect of what we're doing is trying to improve usability of these codes and other related tools. So we're looking at the whole kind of process that these, um, that these pieces of software are used in. Um, so we're looking at how workflows can be used to automate processes around uh, the, the simulations themselves. And finally, an important part of the project is consultancy and training. So we want to be sharing best practices um, from amongst the, the different people in the community and training end users uh, in uh, subjects related to high performance computing and the pieces of software that are shown here. One of the ways that we want to, to interact with uh, the wider community is through interest groups. This slide shows some of the interest groups um, that uh, might be of interest to you, in particular the integrative modeling interest group is probably related to some of the, the work being talked about today. So if you do want to join these interest groups, they're free to join. Uh, you can just go to bioexcel.eu and you'll see how um, you can join these interest groups. Uh, we have forums online. We can also do things like host code repositories. We have a chat channel um, and various other pieces of uh, software and things that we can offer to the interest groups, but also we have um, we have budget for face-to-face -face meetings as well, so we can bring people from these different communities together to discuss their work. Um, we will have some time at the end for questions and answers, so uh, the best way to ask a question is for you to type it into the question box, and you'll see it on your GoToWebinar control panel, which will look something a bit like this. Um, so uh, if you type your question in there, I'll either invite you to, to ask it with your microphone if you have one, or I can read it out to the, the speakers. So now uh, it just falls for me to introduce today's main presenter. Um, and we're very happy to have Guido van Zundert uh, with us today. Um, he studied chemistry and nanomaterials at Utrecht University in the Netherlands. Um, and then he obtained his PhD at the Computational Structural Biology Group um, under the supervision of Professor Alexandre Bonvin, who is also involved in the BioExcel project. His research focused on new methods and protocols for integrative modeling, such as cryo-electron microscopy integration in the Haddock macromolecular docking package. As of October 2016, he joined, the Schrodinger, uh, he joined Schrodinger Inc. Um, as a postdoctoral associate working on room temperature crystallography modeling in collaboration with Stanford University. and uh, University of California, San Francisco. So um, thank you very much, Guido, for joining us today. Uh, I'm now going to open your microphone and, uh, and uh, invite you to present. So um, I will hand over control to you, uh, Guido, so hopefully you can take it from here. All right. 
thanks very much for the introduction, Adam. And thanks for BioXL for uh, giving me the opportunity to, uh, to show some of my software that I've developed. Um, I'm now going to full screen. Is it working? All right. So um, the title of, of the talk is uh, Robust Solutions for cry and Fitting and the Visualization of Interaction Space. And it boils down to that I'm going to discuss two different software packages. One is PowerFit, which is geared towards cryo-electromicroscopy, and the other one is DisVis, uh, which is more used for cross-links, for example, from mass spectrometry, but it works in general for any kinds of biophysical data that you can translate into distance restraints. Uh, a small note, at the moment uh, I work for Schrodinger, so um, they have proprietary software, but the PowerFit and DisVis software have been developed during my stay at uh, uh, Utrecht. And they're all open source, so you can just download them from, uh, from GitHub. Um, let's first discuss the PowerFit software. Uh, so you can just download that from, uh, like I said, from the GitHub page, which is at the bottom of, of this slide. And we also provide um, a web server, of which Mikael and Jörg will talk more about later on. So PowerFit is geared towards uh, cryo-electromicroscopy. This might be a bit superfluous, but um, yeah, the main principle behind uh, cryo microscopy is that you have these two, 2D uh, projections um, which you sort of cut out uh, and you make 2D uh, class averages and from these class averages you can, uh, using like common lines in Fourier space, you can back transform into your original three-dimensional uh, density. Usually you see these isosurfaces which you can see here at the, at the right top of the, of the slide. Uh, but actually what we're actually really dealing with is sort of a three-dimensional image where we go through it uh, slice by slice, as you can see here at the, at the right bottom. So that's sort of really the data that, that, we're, that we're working with. Now, even though there have been major advances in cryo-EM uh, microscopy in these few years, um, building structures ab initio, so without, without only looking or with only looking at the density, is still uh, difficult and a lot of work. So what people usually do is they combine high-resolution structures which have been obtained either by X-ray crystallography, NMR, or homology modeling, and that's what they combine them with cryo-EM data. And typically the first step uh, to proceed is through rigid body uh, structure fitting in the density. Uh, this gives them a sort of local atomic interpretation of the density. This is even done at, at very high resolutions, like at, uh, I think the record is now a bit below two angstrom per single particle, and even there the first step is just rigid body structure fitting. And this is where PowerFit actually comes in. This is where it fills sort of the gap where it does it automatically. And then after you've done that, you can perform real space uh, refinement or manual refinement typically done with, uh, with Coup. Uh, but I'm not going to discuss that, so it's really going to be about the rigid body fitting. And this is important because um, it usually constitutes the first step. Uh, this needs to be done automatically, preferably, because you need to have like an objective measure to fit your structure in the density, because usually people think they see something, um, but it needs to be also like an objective measure to see whether this is really like a good fit. Um, another way is sometimes the, structure, the, the program can see things where you should fit it well, a human cannot see it. So it's sort of both ways. It works, uh, it works both ways. <laughs> So the approach that PowerFit is taking is, is in a way extremely simple and, and, and very basic. So what it does is if you have your initial uh, structure that you want to fit, for example here is uh, KSGA, and to the right you see the, the ribosome density at uh, 13 angstrom resolution, it performs a six-dimensional uh, exhaustive search. So again, yeah, it treats the, 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 the unit as a rigid body, and it tries to fit the subunit in the density at every location uh, in the map. Then it rotates the, the subunit and the procedure starts all over. So it just performs a full six dimensional search of the three translational degrees of freedom and the three rotational degrees of freedom. Um, so what is typically done is this subunit is transformed into a density and the density is then cro cross correlated with um, the, the target map with, with the ribosome. 
and there's like always, I guess, there's like two problems. One is the sensitivity, because even though we're using the cross correlation, there's still a whole sort of class of cross correlation scores that you can use. So you need to sort of optimize that and see what works, what doesn't work, and of all kinds of filters. And the other thing is speed, because it is a six dimensional search, so the sampling uh, will take quite some time actually. So we've tried to optimize both of them in, in PowerFit, and I'm first going to talk about increasing the sensitivity of the cross correlation score. So the first thing, which was, uh, I think, applied in 2002 by uh, Chacon, um, is the Laplace pre filter. And what it does is it transforms your map by just calculating the sort of second derivative at every point in the map. The effect of this is that it enhances the edges. So if you see to the left here, you see a, a figure of some uh, flowers in black and white or in gray image. And if you then apply the Laplace filter, then you see that these edges are sort of enhanced. So this is then a two-dimensional example of a real-life object to see what the effects are. Um, but if you look at it at cryo-electron microscopy data, uh, to the left you have the original data and to the right you have the thing where the Laplace filter has been applied to, you see that the, co the contrast has been uh, increased, also the noise, so we need to take care that you know the noise is not taking uh, too aggressive forms. But this is one thing which has been shown already uh, to really increase the sensitivity of the cross-correlation score. If you just calculate the cross-correlation score between the Laplace filter of, of your original model map and of the uh, target map. Then there's another issue, and that's the, the issue with overlapping neighboring densities. So imagine that you have like a big density map consisting of many chains, and you want to fit each chain individual in the map. Then if there's neighboring structures, then there will be some overlapping density, which will cause systemic noise. So to the left here, you see like two structures together with their density at a certain resolution. Uh, they're, they're not overlapping, but if you look here to the right when they're really neighboring, you see that at the border here, um, there's overlapping density. So there's some, some noise there, which decreases then the sensitivity of the cross-correlation score in general, um, because yeah, again, there's noise to it. In order to minimize this, we can make sure that we sort of put the emphasis of the cross-correlation score on the core of your search object, because that means there's the least amount of, um, of systemic noise from neighboring densities, and so we sort of expect that to be, um, to increase the sensitivity of your scoring function. So this is sort of how it works. Imagine we have like a two-dimensional object here, it's sort of a ball, so a one is like a density which is, uh, you know, which has density, and if it's uh, empty, it means that there's nothing. What we do is we erode it, as it is called, which means we remove the outer layer of, of ones, and we keep eroding this structure until it's sort of empty. If we erode the, the third grid here, then uh, it, it will be empty. And after that, we sum all these grids together, and what you see then is that the core has like an uplifted uh, value. Well, the further away you go from the center or from the core, uh, the lower weight it will have. And this you can build in into the cross-correlation score to sort of uplift the impact of, of your internal, of the, of the core voxels. Uh, this approach was actually implemented, I think, in 2003 by a paper of Wu, uh, but I, uh, we also implemented it in, in PowerFit and we mixed it together with all the other cross-correlation things that, that have been uh, happening there. So these are the two major things which uh, increase the sensitivity of of uh, power fit, and I will show you later on a graph of the, a plot of how sensitive it is actually. Um, so those are the two things that have been implemented on the sensitivity side. Uh, then we also need to take care of, of the speed of the search because it is computationally um, pretty demanding to an extent. Um, so the major thing is that you can calculate these cross correlation scores with using fast Fourier transforms, and to the left here you see just the equations, I won't go through them, uh, but this reduces the computational complexity of uh, calculating all the cross correlations. Uh, the next thing is that we also uh, use optimized rotation sets, 
So we use the least amount of rotations that it po is possible in order to scan a certain density of rotation space. This sounds, uh, this is in reality more complicated than you would naively think it is. Um, so we use the optimized rotation sets. We try to minimize the size of the target by resampling and trimming the target. For example, here you see a cross section of the grow yell complex. Um, and each square here consists of eight by eight voxels. Um, so we can resample it because it was oversampled and we also trimmed the data. So originally we have like a very big grid, but we end up with a very small grid, which heavily um, speeds up the search well, has almost a negligible impact on, uh, on the sensitivity. And finally, um, and also Mikael is going to talk more about that in here, uh, we also transfer the code to will be GPU accelerated. So it works both on multiprocessor systems, but if you have a GPU with OpenCL, so it doesn't matter whether you have NVIDIA or AMD, you can run it on there. So some sort of heuristic kind of examples where we applied uh, PowerFit on. So a typical example to first apply it on is the GrowEL, GrowES system. Uh, usually you see this 23 angstrom map to the left. And what you can do with PowerFit is, for example, if you have the trans subunit here, you can fit it in a density and it will find all top seven solutions there. Uh, the same for the cis part. But if we go for the GrowES uh, sort of uh, helmet or button or lid, the GrowES lid, we need to use the whole lid because at the 23 angstrom resolution, there's just not enough information to fit each subunit independently. However, if you use like a nine angstrom map, which is also available at the EMDB, uh, you can fit uh, one of these grow yes subunits independently. So you can see there's more information there. So you can fit this small subunit and in the density. You can see then the impact of, of the resolution. Uh, to be honest, I'm never too impressed if, if things work on the grow EL, grow yes system because almost all algorithms I've thrown at it works there, but it fails at, at different, uh, more yeah, typically more difficult uh, targets. For example, the ribosome. Uh, so I also applied it to some uh, to two ribosome examples early on. So we can fit this uh, RSGA structure here in the density in a 10 angstrom res resolution ribosome map, and the same for this KSGA structure here for uh, at 13 angstrom. But this is of course just very heuristically. So we wanted to explore actually the limits of of, of rigid body fitting and see whether we can uh, whether we can detect whether the top fit really is like substantially better than the next best, best fit. Because since PowerFit is just, you know, in a way a stupid computer program, it will always give you a solution, but you don't know whether you can trust the solution. So in order to sort of discover that, we uh, try to apply it to many cases. So we downloaded from the EMDB five semi-high resolution ribo, uh, ribosome maps in the, in the range of 5.5 to 7 angstrom. And what we did was we tried to fit each subunit that was fitted in the ribosome map, uh, in the ribosome, uh, in its respective map with power fit. So there were in total 379 subunits. And in order to get the impact of the resolution, we sort of down filtered the original ribosome experimental density all the way down to 30 angstrom. So what you get is the following. So we have see here four scores. Uh, the blue one is the regular local cross correlation. That's sort of the base score. The green is if we apply also the core weighted procedure, if I, as I've introduced. The LLCC is if you also apply the Laplace pre-filter uh, before it. And the yellow one is if you apply the Laplace pre-filter and the core weighted approach uh, uh, together with the cross correlation. On the y-axis, we see the success rate of the 379 uh, subunits. And on the uh, x-axis, we see the resolution of the map. And as you can see, the local cross correlation, sort of the base score is able to fit about like 75% um, of the cases. And it falls down rapidly and it's almost like 5% uh, uh, or 10% at 15 angstrom resolution. If we use the core weighted approach, things get a bit better, like it shifts one or two angstrom to the right, which is good. So the success rate is going higher. It's increasing, and also if we apply the, only the Laplace filter, uh, it gets substantially better, so this is by far the biggest impact. Uh, but again, if we, uh, if we combine it together with the core weighted procedure, 
and the local cross correlation, then the sensitivity increases even further. So, so far, uh, to my knowledge, this has been the most sensitive scoring function out there so far. Uh, then the next question, of course, is, okay, so here I only looked at the number one uh, best solution that PowerFit gave me, but can I also check whether this top solution actually makes sense? Can I deduce from some kind of metric or some kind of objective score whether the top solution can be trusted or not? And in order for this, um, we applied the, the Fisher Z transformation, uh, which is a simple transformation of your cross-correlation coefficient. Uh, here's the formula, so you just take sort of the, the log of one plus your cross-correlation divided by minus, minus your cross-correlation. So the reason why you want to do this is because you can then um, um, provide confidence intervals on this Z-score. So you can provide a confidence interval, a sort of error measure on your uh, cross-correlation, and this gives a sort of sigma, which is uh, normally distributed. So this sigma, you can back calculate it in a sort of probability density. Uh, this was introduced uh, already in 1921 by Fisher, the, the Fisher, that's why the Fisher Z transformation and Volkmann introduced it uh, in Crow em So if we then look at the top solution that PowerFit is giving and the second best solution, and we calculate the difference in, sigma, in sigmas between those two scores, uh, we get the following uh, on our true positive rate. So here on the x-axis you see the sigma difference between again the top score and the second best score and on the y-axis you see um, whether the top solution is actually really the correct solution and this is very interesting because you can see that if there's a big difference in sigma between your one uh, between the, the top score and the second best score like around uh, two or higher we almost have like a hundred percent chance that this is indeed like the correct solution indeed um, this goes nicely down if you go to uh, uh, like 0 0.25 sigma. So if you do a power fit uh, analysis, if you do some rigid body fitting and you want to see is my top solution, can it be trusted, uh, just look at the sigma value of your top solution and compare it to the second best uh, sigma values. And if this difference is, let's say, higher than 2, then you should be very uh, confident in your in your, in your fitting approach or in the result. So this is a, actually a major thing because you, you're always looking for objective measures to validate your approach and here you can see that there are actually objective measures uh, which can validate it. Uh, that brings me to the end of the, of the power fit section. So again it's just a simple software which performs a rigid body uh, fitting procedure but uh, with, uh, with optimized sensitivity and, and, and speed, while also providing robust indicators for reliability measures. Now, the second software is this, which is actually tackles a, diff a totally different kind of, of, of problem, but it uses the same uh, procedures or same algorithms as, as PowerFit, actually. So when I came up with the idea of this, this I was looking at a case for which we had like two, uh, two structures, and there were crosslinks available between them. So crosslinks, you can get them from mass spectrometry, and they sort of define uh, a distance between two residues. So I had these two structures together with the uh, with the crosslinks, and I was thinking like, okay, uh, are these actually consistent anyway? Like, are there any solutions out there? Can I can think of of configuration of the complex where these crosslinks are actually um, consistent with each other? And first I wanted to, so in a way the, the, the question I wanted to answer is like given two interacting structures and a set of distance constraints between them, are there any solutions that satisfy all constraints or in general n constraints? Uh, I first wanted to solve this analytically but uh, I wasn't really managing and I don't know whether it's possible. But after introducing or working with PowerFit, uh, I actually had the tools to approach this numerically. So again, what we do with this is we make a shape out of, uh, out of the receptor and uh, we divide it into a core region, which is in blue, and the interaction region, which is in gray. And then for the ligand, or the scanning chain in a way, uh, we call that the ligand, uh, we only make the core region. So this is sort of defined by the van der Waals radius. So in here, 
it's sort of clashing. And what we can do then is just use the same algorithms as in PowerFit with a Fourier transform and, and a full six-dimensional search to just sample billions of complexes. So if this core region is overlapping with only the gray region, it means that the two structures are interacting. If the core region of the ligand is, uh, is interacting with the core region of, of the receptor, it means that it's clashing. So we define here a complex as a sort of configuration where there is interaction between the receptor and the ligand, but there is no or hardly any clashes between the, between the two of those. Um, again, we do then a fine six-dimensional search, and this uh, um, results in, in billions of complexes that we sample. I will show you some numbers later on. So the whole procedure in this is actually based on just counting. So we sample all the billions of complexes, um, uh, of possible complexes, and for each complex, we just count how many of the constraints or the crosslinks are satisfied. So we just count and we just get numbers. So that's why you get this boring table, but it, it gives you information. So what you see here on the left column, you see the number of consistent restra uh, restraints or constraints. I use those terms interchangeably here. Um, and in the second column, you see how many of those, uh, how many uh, sampled complexes are found for a certain number of consistent restraints. And to the right, you see the fraction. So it's divided by all the complexes sampled. So interesting numbers here if you start on top. So we look at complexes which are consistent with zero restraints or more. And that just means all the complexes we have found. And it's this big number, which is, uh, I think, 19 billion. And that we set to one. And then we just move on all the way to the bottom of the table. So we look at complexes which are consistent with all eight of the restraints that we, uh, with, that we garnet. However, we see then that there are zero complexes found. And that means that at least one of the restraints in your, in your set is actually a false positive. Then we can go on a bit further. We look at complexes consistent with seven of the eight restraints. And then this vis finds about like 10,000 of them. Uh, that doesn't mean that all of those seven restraints are, um, are non-false positive, that they're all um, true positive restraints. It just means that at least there are complexes out there which are consistent with with, with seven of them. So we know now that the whole set of eight restraints is not fully consistent. So the next step is, of course, to sort of see which one of those restraints is actually the false positive. So we're then exploring uh, the data consistency uh, and we're trying to detect false positive constraints. So we start again as what we did for uh, the initials, uh, initial step of this risk. So we again systematically sample the, all the complexes. Uh, we count for each complex how many constraints are satisfied or are consistent. And then the next step is for each complex consistent with n constraints, we count how often a specific constraint is violated. So we just check in a set of, for example, all complexes consistent with all constraints uh, or all minus one, we check which one of that constraint is then violated. So then we get, uh, and we normalize over all the complexes, so we get a fraction instead of a, of a big number because that's uh, that's more insightful. So again, we get even more numbers. Um, I will uh, I will again uh, help you go through the table. So the first column again to the left here is uh, the number of consistent restraints. So for example, if we look here at the eight column, we look at complexes consistent with eight restraints. And the other columns are how often this restraint, uh, a certain restraint, has been violated in all the complexes consistent with all restraints. So if we look at the first, uh, at, at the bottom row of uh, complexes consistent with eight restraints, we see that all the restraints violations are set to zero, which is, which makes perfect sense because if we're looking at all our complexes consistent with all restraints, it means that none of the restraints are violated. So all of them are by definition zero. Uh, however, in this case, it's a bit more complicated because we didn't find any complexes consistent with eight restraints, uh, but we decided just uh, by definition to put them at zero anyway. So no matter what you run, the, the bottom uh, row uh, will always be zero. 
then we go uh, one row up and we look at all complexes consistent with seven restraints. For those we found, we found like 10,000. And what we see then is that all restraints are never violated. So restraint one until seven are not violated. But restraint number eight has, is like violated in, yeah, in 100% of all cases. So that's great because we know that there's one false positive in the set. And this means that restraint eight is actually the false positive. Uh, we should continue with this. So restraint eight is, is false, so we put a red circle around it. Uh, then we look at all complexes consistent with at least six restraints. Um, we see here that most restraints are never violated in that set, but restraint seven is now suddenly violated in 99.7% of the, of the cases. So that's like a huge amount. So it's very fishy in a way. So restraint seven is uh, something to, to keep an eye on. So we mark that sort of yellow. Uh, we go one uh, one more up until uh, we feel that we're safe, that we can trust all, all the restraints. So we look at restraints one to six, and the numbers are still not super high. You could argue that for restraint four, for which there's now 37% uh, uh, um, violation, you could argue that that's high, but compared to the 94% and the 100% for restraint seven and eight, I think it's more trustworthy than the others. And this is actually uh, great because what I did with the eight restraints was I, I used six experimentally determined restraints, which were all consistent with the data. And I added also two false positives and these were actually restraints seven and eight. Uh, so with eight, we are sort of guaranteed that it's a false positive, but with uh, restraint seven, it's a bit more difficult and you have to sort of just trust a bit in it that this is, uh, that this is at least you know that it's fishy, that you, you need to look out for restraint number seven. Um, we can also count other things. For example, we can explore which residues are mostly accessed. So it starts again with the two uh, procedures as always, just uh, systematically sample billions of complexes, count through each complex how many constraints are satisfied, and then for each complex, um, count how often a specific residue interacts. And we look then at, again at complexes consistent with, for example, all restraints or all minus one. And again, we just normalize this over all counted complexes, and then we get a, uh, a term which is called the average interactions per complex. For each residue, we get this. And then we sort of postulate that probably uh, uh, residues that form many interactions are more likely to be at the interface. Um, for example, we applied this on, on, uh, on, the, on the case that I showed you before, and uh, these red parts here are the residues that are often, uh, that had a high accessible, uh, a high average interactions per complex ratio. And these are actually also almost all interface residues. We need to quantify this a bit more, but so far it all looks uh, very good. So that's the part of, of sort of quant, uh, uh, quant quantization of, of the information content and see, um, how consistent is our data and what can we extract from the distance restraints. Uh, but another thing is like a question as in where can the ligand be found for complexes consistent with n restraints? So where in space is, is the ligand presiding if I have these, uh, if I have these uh, distance restraints or constraints? And for this we have made a sort of like density grid, which you can uh, visualize either in PyMol or UCSF Chimera, uh, which is a discrete density, and you can increase or decrease the value of this density, which is, uh, um, and this shows you sort of the region um, where the center of mass of the ligand is for it to be consistent with a certain number of restraints. So what you see here to the left, uh, in this gray area, uh, this is where the center of mass of the ligand can be. Um, if it's to be consistent with the six original uh, experimental uh, constraints. The orange center here is actually the real center of mass in, in the complex. So you can see that it nicely falls inside this gray area. So this gives you a region in space where the, where the center of mass of the, of the ligand can be. Uh, you lose all orientation information here, so you don't know what the orientation of the ligand is, but at least you know that its center of mass uh, should be there. Then uh, the last question that, that you can ask is, in yeah, what 
what space does the ligand most likely occupy? Uh, and then more specifically for complexes with n restraints. So where in space, so what what space is, is mostly occupied by the ligand? Uh, this gives you then sort of an average shape kind of information. And what you get out of it is then if we look at this occupancy analysis for complexes consistent with all the six restraints, we get this sort of uh, continuous density again. And what this uh, density means is, for example, if you put the ISO contour on 25% or 0 0.25, um, it means that this space here, which is enclosed by this gray volume, has been occupied by the ligand in 25% of all the cases, of all the complexes consistent with all, uh, with all six restraints, with all true positive restraints. Of course, if you reduce this ISO contour value, for example, 10%, this uh, the, the, the volume, the, the space occupied by the ligand becomes bigger in a way. Um, and what this, uh, what this density means is that in 10% of all the complexes that are consistent with all six restraints, uh, this is where the, where the ligand presides. So it really gives you like an average shape. So is this helpful? Like, uh, is it sort of truthful what it gives you? Um, so what you see here in orange is actually the original the, the structure as it is, the, the, the complex. And you can see if you look at the 25% ISO contour level that this shape is sort of matching in a way um, uh, the, 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 the structure of the complex, which is nice because it gives you that there's low resolution information of where the ligand can be found. And the most likely place of where the ligand can be found for complexes consistent with, for example, all restraints or all minus one or in whatever number you're interested. And that brings me to the conclusion. So I've showed you PowerFit, which, is a, which combines speed, sensitivity, and reliability for rigid body fitting. A uh, very important step in high resolution modeling in cryo data. And I also introduced you this VIS for some more explorative modeling uh, for determining the accessible interaction space, uh, the set of all consistent complexes, and how you can visualize and quantify many of these, uh, of these um, uh, sort of parameters. And that's it from my part. So, yes, thank you. Uh, yes, perfect. Yes, thank you very much indeed. Um, so, uh, we will have some time for some questions at the end. You're welcome to type your questions into the question box in the GoToWebinar control panel at any time. Um, but we'll, uh, I'll take them at the end once, um, once we finish with the, the presentations today. Um, so, thank you, Guido. I'm now going to hand over to my colleague. Uh, Mikhail, who's going to uh, give you a demonstration of some of these things. Okay, then maybe you can, uh, yeah, share the screen of your um, Yes, I think, oh, sorry, did I, okay. Uh, that's okay. Uh, in the meantime, I can uh, I can quickly introduce ourselves. So I'm Michael Tre, um, and I'm sitting together with uh, with your Charles Milton. Uh, we both work in a, in a group of Alexandre Bromain here uh, at Utrecht University. We're both postdoc, and we we worked on uh, on the web portals, but because of this, on part of it. So there is this nice uh, overview of the two software. We're going a bit into uh, new interfaces we developed to to use them uh, in a what we think user-friendly way. Um, so one of the one of the one of the main advantage of this new web server that has have been up for a bit more than six months now uh, is that they use uh, some GPU uh, resources provided by the ETI, the European uh, Grid Infrastructure. And as Rido already said, uh, this GPU computation is uh, quite powerful over uh, the, the normal CPU usage you could have on a regular uh, computer. Uh, so we, we made some, some numbers quickly to, to compare that. So when you use uh, a local cluster made of uh, eight CPUs, you can see that uh, you, you get an average time, for instance, for the area that polymerize using this piece of with a complete uh, complete scan of the, of the space of, uh, of 266 minutes on when you go on the GPU, uh, you reduce that and you speed up six times 
uh, by six time and you reach this 45 minutes uh, speed, which is kind of, of, of significant, but that's one of the main advantages of the of the web server, web server that they are using this GPU calculation provided by the AGI. To, uh, I won't go into technical details of the, of the implementation of the web server, just quickly over the main uh, steps. Um, so of course it starts by uh, a web form that a user has, uh, has to submit after, uh, after a very short uh, step of registration. Uh, so once you, you submit a web form, so basically this is our core of it, uh, job. Uh, we make some quick validation on a, on a web server uh, site, uh, the user credential, but also the field value are checked on if uh, anything is wrong, we directly output to the user that something went, uh, went wrong, of course, and that you can just correct uh, the few mistakes he might have made. Uh, if a job successfully goes through this validation step, uh, we have a pre-processing uh, step that involves some packaging of the input file still on the web server uh, site. And once this step is done, on, is done we, can, uh, we can go to the master node, which is our interface between the working nodes uh, on, the, on the web server. And basically, you have two solutions there. So you either submit to local nodes that we have here in Red Hat, uh, and use some uh, CPU uh, computational time, um, or under the second option, that the, the one we want to highlight, you can submit to a green node, so basically to to one of the GPU cluster uh, provided by the EGI uh, that has some, uh, some GPU. Um, to, to run GPUs on PowerFit on these uh, working nodes, we're using Docker, so some Docker containers that, uh, that have some inst an installation of GPUs on PowerFit. Why do we use Docker containers? Because first, we don't have, um, we don't have complete control of the, of the GPU cluster. Uh, they can be all around the world, Europe, at least and some, sometimes the world, so we don't have any right there. So we, we cannot really control what, what is installed. Uh, so the Docker uh, solution is quite handy because you just have to basically download a Docker container, and then, then run it, and then when it's done, when the, either a DSV or a profit job is done, uh, you just retrieve your data and you, you, let, you let the, the GPU cluster quite clear. Uh, so that's something uh, quite handy, and it also allows uh, very quick updates of the software if needed. Uh, for instance, when we, we need to, to catch up with the, with the GPU driver, uh, we, we can easily use the, 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 Docker, uh, the Docker container. They are, of course, available for users, and you can find them on the Indigo Data Cloud apps. Um, so that's also something you can use on your, on your site. So once a job... Uh, come back from a, from a working node. Uh, on, on a master node, we, we package the output files. Uh, on one of the, on a few of the files, sorry, of the output file, are processed uh, on our local uh, cluster uh, by camera to, to do some image generation. You will see that um, that's, that allows us uh, in the results page to have some, uh, some visualization of the results. That's something you don't get automatically on a, on a, look, on a standalone usage of this visual power of it. Uh, and then, in parallel, and at the same time, you have a post-processing that is also done of all the raw values output by this visual power of it. Uh, and the idea is there to, to, to format these results in order to, to nicely present them to, to the users. Uh, and it's still done on the, on the web server, so you have a complete results page that uh, takes all the output of this visual power of it and nicely format on the present them to the users. Um, so I went a bit quickly on all these steps. Now we can we can see a bit more in detail how it, uh, how it goes in a real life, let's say. So I leave, I leave uh, New York explaining you uh, through a live demo how we, we can run this with important. Okay, so both uh, web servers are hosted here in uh, Utrecht. So they are available via the main website of the group, which is hedoc.science.eu.nl. And you see up here, there's this with and PowerFit available. You can directly go to the main page, and on those uh, main pages, uh, you just get a basic uh, description of the server. You can see a comparison of the runtimes on the grid and on the cloud resources of a default job based on the settings. You also see the references, and down here, you also have the uh, GitHub repository if you want to download the Disvis software. In order to run a job, you should first uh, register, because we have to keep track of uh, who's submitting to the 
especially to the cloud resources, uh, because this is usually uh, reserved for academic users, so we need to know who's running the jobs. That's why you have to can register, but it's usually processed very quickly. And once you have your uh, credentials, you can go to the submission page. And it basically gives you pretty much all the options that uh, this is a command line tool will give you. You can give even a specific uh, tech to your run to, for later tracking, so you know uh, what you actually did. For example, uh, just give it an example run. And then you can provide your input files, which is usually for this list. As you know, you have a fixed chain, which is a part that will be ca uh, that is kept uh, fixed. Then you have the scanning chain, and you need the restraints file. That is pretty much all the required input for this list. And you could also uh, uh, submit some extra residues for the interaction analysis. And then you have the options to do the quick scanning, which is basically very fast. Analysis, which we rough search, but you can also do a complete scanning. For this, the occupancy analysis is done automatically, or you go to custom scanning, and then you have control over the fine grain control. Uh, but you can also look at the parameters that are used for complete and quick scanning, but you can uh, adjust it if you use this option. Then you have to provide the email address with which you registered. And once everything is in, you are able to submit the job. And then you get basically get the run ID. Uh, you also get the tag you gave it to the run. And this page will be up to, uh, updated every 60 seconds until your results are available. Um, and you get an, also an email notification to the email address you registered with, that, with the ID or the link where you can monitor your run. And you will also get an email once it's, uh, the run has been processed successfully. If you go back to the main page, you have other uh, options to look at. You have also a help page, which kind of gives you a little bit more detail on the expected input and output. And the email address where you can uh, ask for support. And there's also a link to a tutorial, which goes to the Bonman Lab web page. Uh, at the moment, we only have a PowerFit tutorial for the command line version and for the web server, but uh, uh, this was, uh, tutorial will be online uh, uh, shortly. And you can also go to the BioExcel support forum where you can ask your questions directly and so that other users can profit, uh, profit from the questions that might be coming uh, as well. And you can also browse uh, maybe that your question or the issue you encounter has already been encountered before, so you can check this out. Okay. And on the main page, you also have the link to go directly to the uh, GPU accelerator. So as soon as you see in the header uh, the grid enabled, you know that you are submitting to the uh, GPU resources and not to the local ones. <clears throat> and the examples you will get for uh, the results you will get for this list. So once the processing is complete, uh, you will get a page like this. So first you see uh, here. For the example, you have a description of what the example is uh, uh, about. Then you have the, the your results as a target, uh, including all the files you would get from this list. You can also download the images that we generated uh, for presentation on the web server if you're interested in that. And you see the references. So for this list, we display the accessible interaction space, uh, basically at different levels of restraints. So in this example, uh, this would be the accessible interaction space, uh, the center of mass of the complexes for six restraints. And you have uh, six different views of, you, of the protein to see, uh, of the space to see where it is located. Uh, and then you get also the, the table, which kind of lists you the complexes that are consistent with that number of restraints. And we see as in the presentation already, we have the same uh, settings that Pedro presented, so we don't have any complexes consistent with eight restraints. And then we also present the C-score that were calculated, and in this table you can see uh, actually the, the C-score uh, of this, and it also highlights the ones that are most likely false positive, so you can solve on this C-score and get the putative false positive restraints, and you also see the violations. 
how often residues are violated, and this is also highlighted the most uh, likely violated residues, or the ones which are most likely false positives. And then you also get the interaction analysis, and here you also, uh, for residues you supplied, and here you see uh, which are most often in contact to the receptor. So basically, uh, with the color coding, you kind of try to highlight the important information. <clears throat> in case you have a one where all uh, restraints are met, then you will not get any highlighting, but this will just uh, notify you that there are actually complexes consistent with all restraints, so you might not even discard any of those. And for power fit, uh, the server looks pretty much uh, similar. So uh, we have again the landing page with all the information and the links to the uh, grid and the local server. And you can go to the submission page, which has all the features as well. Uh, so here you have the, uh, the default power, uh, parameters for PowerFit. You have the you need to provide your map, a resolution of the map. Then you can provide the structure that's supposed to fit, be fitted. Uh, if you if the uh, structure has multiple chains and you only want to fit one of those at a time, you can also provide chain IDs. And you can also give it uh, the run attack for uh, later uh, uh, tracking and the rotational sampling interval will kind of uh, de determine how how fine grained the sampling is uh, and this should be ten should be fine but you can go down to five and below five it's limited because then the sampling will get too big but you also have the option to do some uh, fine uh, have some fine control over the run like uh, disabling the pre filter. Uh, removing the core weight scoring function, but based on the results we just showed, I guess it's not usually not something you want to do, so it's not uh, displayed by default. And then you can submit the run, run, and again we uh, <coughs> we present we kind of present the uh, results in a more uh, formatted way than the uh, plain text that you will get from PowerFit. Uh, you can download the, all the output files in the archive. You can download the images that are processed, and we display the best 15 solutions, and also uh, show the sigma difference to the, uh, the highlight the sigma difference to the next, which Ida was saying. If it's above three, uh, it, it most likely a uh, proof positive, or oh, we at two. And then for each fit, so, so by default the first, best 10 structures are. Out, uh, uh, provided from PowerFit, and we provide the images of those uh, fitted structures in with the density map, and again in six different resolutions. And you can also download the PDBs uh, this separately if you don't want to download all the run files. Again, there are multiple examples uh, available. So here you only have one fit. PowerFit actually only manages to fit one, uh, provide one fit of the structure. And with this complex, you see uh, you have the Cori L complex, and due to symmetry, you don't have a, such a good separation between the symmetric process, but you still get a one top fit. Okay, that's pretty much all from our side. So I guess we can go to the questions. Thank you very much, Jörg. Um, that was that was great to see. So you can step through. So we have one question already in here. So um, just before I read that one out, I'll remind people that uh, you can ask your questions now uh, by typing them into the, the questions box. Um, so Pradfal, do you have uh, a microphone? If so, um, I'm, I'll uh, invite you to ask your question directly um, to the speaker. Oh, I'm just having a look. Maybe that. Rajval has um, has dropped out from this session. Uh, so I'm going to read out the question anyway, then at least he will get his um, answer on the recording. So uh, the question he asked, and I presume this is um, for, for Guido, he asks, uh, how to fit atomic detail structure of monomer protein on cryo-EM map, 25 angstrom resolution, um, of filament of 25 monomeric units, and how reliable is it? For example, cryo EM map ID. Okay, he's giving some quite specific details here. Um, do you need to know the 
the, the details to answer the question. So how to fit atomic detail structure of monomer protein on cryo-EM map at 25 angstrom resolution of filament of 25 monomeric units, and how reliable is it? Is that right. something that can be answered? So the reliability, we can just, you can look at the sigma score, right, that was given. Uh, so that, that's how you can see whether it's reliable or not. Uh, furthermore, to fit it is, I don't know, for, to me, you, you can just use, use PowerFit, so um, either through the web server or locally, and you collect the top 25 solutions, or you look at the top 30 solutions and see whether it makes sense. Um, okay. So yes, yeah, so definitely, you would assume that all 25 should be uh, highly significant compared to, to other solutions. Um, so the full atomic data, I mean, it, it's converted into a density anyway. So as long, we, we need that full atomic data anyway to to uh, fit it in inside the density. For example, we also tried it once if you only have C alpha atoms, uh, but then the cross correlation is not calculated nicely. So you, we, we really need to have full atomic detail structures in order to fit them properly. Okay, thank you very much. So, um, Prajwa, I hope that uh, answers your question if you're watching this later in the recording. Uh, if not, then this gives me a good opportunity to point people at the fact that we have a uh, question and answer forum called ask.bioexcel.eu. If you go there, you can um, uh, you can ask any other follow-up questions that occur to you. Um, so for the people in the room just now, do we have any other questions, either about the software itself or the web-based services that are offered to access it. Okay, I, I maybe have um, one question then, just while there's a, or we can see if we get any others in from the floor. Um, so Guido, I, I was just interested to know, and, before the, the web-based um, service was available, do, did you have a, any way to, ac uh, to access how many people were using your, your software? And do you think having the web-based version has broadened out access to the, to the code? Uh, definitely. I mean, we could see how many people are downloaded, for example, on, on GitHub. You can see how often your repository has been cloned. Um, so there were several uh, that, that cloned the code, but since um, uh, the web server interface, I think it has increased a lot. So I, I guess it just made it more accessible and people don't have to deal with the installation. Um, the results are also displayed. Um, it, it, it makes more sense how the results are displayed. So it's definitely an add-on to to uh, to making your software more available. Definitely. Okay, thank you for that, Guido. Um, so uh, I think we have one question in now from um, um, Elizabeth. Uh, Anne Elizabeth, um, do you have a, a microphone? I'm going to try and unmute you, and you can ask your question directly. If so, Anne Elizabeth. Okay, no microphone, so I will read out the question in that case. So the question is um, as follows. Uh, for, she says, thank you for these clear and interesting lectures. I have a question about PowerFit. Does the software accept PDB with UNK residues or missing residues? Yes, definitely. I mean, as long as, as the elements are known, it, it just works. There's no, no concept as connectivity. So you just, it's more, you, you should see at your structures, you should look at it more as a collection of atoms. So whether these are connected or whether, uh, whether there's residues, new residues, unknown residues, it, it's all in there. It doesn't matter. As long as it's just a, a set of, of atoms, it should definitely work. Um, again, we do, in order to, to make 
to make sense of the cross correlation function, you do need to have an all atom view of it. Uh, again, if you only have like C alpha atoms, it's probably not going to work. Um, but if residues or unknown new things doesn't matter as long as it's just an element, um, we can deal with it. Okay, thank you, uh, Anne Elizabeth. I hope that answers your question. Um, yes, she says that uh, she'll, she'll test that out soon. That's great. Okay, well, we're reaching the top of the hour now, so unless we have any other questions, now's your last chance to type them into the question box, then uh, all that remains to me uh, to do is to say thank you very much to all of our presenters today and to remind you that if you have any follow-up questions, you can post them at ask.bioexcel.eu. Um, we will have more webinars coming up um, in the next few weeks. Uh, we don't have a precise date yet for the next one, but I'd invite you to keep your eyes open at bioexcel.eu slash webinars, uh, where you'll be able to find out about everything that's going on. And if you're interested in this kind of work, please do sign up to our interest groups as well. Thank you all very much for coming along today, and I hope you found that useful, and um, do keep in touch with what BioXL is doing. <laughs>